I've been coaching now full time for well over two years, and because of this, I can say for sure that ELO Hell really does exist. For many lower ELO players, their teammates are genuinely holding them back, and I've even had students who are stuck in iron make a fresh account that starts in gold, and then climb all the way up to diamond, with a great win rate, despite the fact they were previously stuck in iron. But how is this possible? This is because in lower ranks, the objectively correct play is not always the best decision to make when you have lower elo teammates, and you should be changing the way that you play dramatically depending on the elo you're playing in. Now I've got a pretty good resume when it comes to solo queue. I've been challenger across four different servers and rank one multiple times, but the way that I would play at a lower elo like iron or silver differs dramatically from the way I would play on my main account, which is why I made today's video. I'll be taking you through all the strategies that I would use and how I would adjust my gameplay to be better equipped to carry my way out of ELO Hell and to carry every game that I play, even with the worst teammates the matchmaking could possibly throw at me. My name's Rogue and I played League of Legends professionally for 7 years. Now I'm a full time content creator and coach for all ranks iron through to challenger. So if you want more information of what a coaching session with me will look like, you can find more information by following the link in the video description below. While you're in the description, you'll also find the link to my Patreon, where I post all of the recordings of my best coaching sessions in full. With collections sorted by role and rank, including sessions where I've coached for professional level teams, you can get a glimpse into what pro-level League of Legends look like from the inside. No matter what you're looking for, you'll easily be able to find something that's going to help you improve, no matter your rank. If you place a challenger player in lane against a bronze player, that bronze player won't last more than a minute without getting solo killed. This is because lower ranked players are constantly making mistakes that you can capitalize on in order to get ahead early, which means that playing champions with early game fighting power is your best bet against them. With more early game power, you can capitalize and punish more easily on these mistakes that they make. And most of the time, this means playing champions who take keystones that give you early game fighting power, like Lethal Tempo and Conqueror, who often your opponent won't even consider as an advantage you have when they fight you. Now this fight in front of you starts off terribly for Jinx, with her literally face taking a thresh hook in front of the enemy tower. But there's just one thing her opponent hasn't considered. Jinx already has 3 sacks of lethal tempo from poking her opponents, whilst Ophelios has the inferior fleet footwork, meaning that Jinx is far stronger in these early game fights. Now look at the uptime of Jinx's lethal tempo in this fight. Despite the fight starting off in the worst way possible for her, Jinx won this fight because her enemies being lower elo players made a very common mistake and hadn't considered the gap in the ADC keystones when they went for their all-in. But for ADC players in lower ranks, this early fighting power is even more important because it also allows you to cover the mistakes that you can expect your own support to make. In this replay, our Caitlyn player has fleet footwork. The keystone is considered objectively better for Caitlyn because of her long range. Now when her support walks up too far and is engaged on by Pantheon, at a moment where Caitlyn should be freely stacking her lethal tempo, she instead doesn't trade back much damage and her support is just forced to flash for free. Moments later this happens again, and Caitlyn with a stronger keystone would likely be able to finish this kill off on Ezreal and have finished this fight with far more health and been less likely to die to Pantheon in the end. Now in a different clip of one of my students who I've got to start playing Caitlyn with lethal tempo, you can see its early power. Despite it not being the meta choice by high elo players, it is superior in these lower ranked games. Not only does it have early fighting power to help you capitalize on your opponent mistakes, but in lower ranks there is always going to be senseless fighting. You are missing out on the opportunity to be strong and capitalize on random fights that happen in the river over nothing. If the fights are going to happen anyway, it's best for you to turn up to them and turn up to them strong. And if your opponent wants to choose to take fights against you early when you're at your strongest, that will only work in your favor. Now I wanted to find some stats showing the average kills per minute grasped by rank in order to back up this claim, but I couldn't find any. But what I found instead is the average deaths players have in a game sorted by rank, and the results of this are conclusive. The lower the rank you are playing at, the more people die in a game. This means that when I play at a lower rank, farming minions would become far less of a priority for me, since there is often so much more gold to be obtained if you instead participate in these fights and personally benefit from the inting. That's where the decision to play Lethal Tempo Caitlyn is coming from. Now sure, Fleet Footwork works better with her kit, favoring a slower, poke-heavy playstyle, but in every clip we've just looked at, there is an immediate fight to the death. Lethal Tempo means more early game power when an ADC needs it the most, so that's what we take. For junglers, that means playing early game skirmishes. As a mid laner, you want to steer clear of weak scalers like Cassidy, and for support mains, champions like Leona and Brahm excel in these early fistfights. But by far, in my time coaching, the students that have the quickest and most substantial improvement are top laners, who play Conqueror Champions with Ignite. Here is a screenshot of the recent match history of one of my students named Phoenix5, who plays exactly this style. 
And as you can see, he has incredibly high kills and assists every single game he plays, even when he loses. Phoenix 5 was already featured earlier in this video. He was the Renekton we saw getting all of those level 2 solo kills, and this is something he consistently does now. The early game fighting power of a champion like Renekton, paired with the fighting power of a keystone like Conqueror, with even more fighting power on top with the Ignite, means that tiny mistakes are able to be capitalized on in lane to get these early kills. And in early game fights that end up being the catalyst to snowball the game, he's always the strongest member and can capitalize on the mistake his low elo opponents make choosing to fight into such a strong champion early. Now I have here a replay from one of Phoenix 5's games that he played just before that massive win streak that we saw in his match history just earlier. Now this is actually from a live coaching game that we played together. So he's playing and I'm on Discord with him and he's screen sharing to me and I'm giving some guidance about where to go, what to do, when to fight, when to chill. So I like this replay a lot because it's a very dominant one and it shows that with a little bit of early game fighting power, it can really go a long way to dominate a game and snowball at this rank. So with a very small advantage here, we have a slightly bigger minion wave than Darius and we have Ignite when he doesn't. We're going to look for a fight and see if he wants to take one. And we're going to get that fight. Really good stuff. So we're going to go in, trade some sums. All right, that's all of Darius' summoner spells and he has almost no HP. So we crash the wave, of course. And really good stuff. Darius is going to miss about a wave and a half here. Great stuff. So now we have about half a level lead. Pretty far ahead. That's really good. When we get back to lane, we're obviously not going to fight Darius here. He is a massive stacked up wave. We never want to fight an opponent to stacked up wave. So I said, just be really safe. Really just conserve your HP. No fighting. Just back up. Really good stuff. We just want to catch this wave, get all of that XP banked up, and use that half a level lead when we have it. So now that we've cleared out that wave, really good stuff. We can look for some small trades now. I said nothing too major. We haven't realized our half level lead yet. We haven't hit our level six, but if we get some small trades in the meantime, that's great. But really we just want to push for our six. So we get some small trades, good stuff. And we're about to come up on our level six. Once we get it, all right, go, let's turn on our aggression. So we have level six advantage. We have Conqueror. We have a strong early game champion and Darius is fighting us. Okay. Well, he's not going to win that, so we get a free kill. Really good stuff. Let's crash the wave into the tower, grab a plate, go for a recall. Darius loses another couple waves. Really good stuff. We're super far ahead now. We have a full one level lead. We have about five, 600 gold lead. So we'll catch our wave, push another one. And then not really sure what Darius was thinking here. Interesting play, but that's okay. Because this opens up the possibility now to go for what I call, and I've made a video about this, a multi-part play. This is due in part because we're ahead, but it's also due in part because we're so much stronger because we're playing a Conqueror champion with Ignite that is strong early game. So now we go for a proxy between the two towers. We're so strong here that our Darius player just can't get past us. So let's see what he does. We're two levels higher. We have a gold lead, we have Ignite and we have Conqueror. All right, Darius is not winning this fight. Let's see what he does now that he knows he can't win this fight. Hold on a second. Renekton has 12 stack Conqueror, and what Darius did was flash into his ultimate to reapply his 12 stack Conqueror. So now he's flashing into opponent with 12 stack Conqueror, a strong early game champion, ult on with Ignite, and they die. Warwick's even here to die as well. Why would Warwick ever try and gank for a lane that is losing this hard where he obviously can't win the fight? I have no idea, but at least the enemy is going to learn from their lesson. If Warwick came top and he ganked a lane that was two levels up on him, and the gank didn't work and he died, surely he wouldn't do it again. Oh, he's back. Even though we have red buff now and are still two levels ahead and still have Conqueror, so we're just gonna kill him again. They constantly make the same mistake. They are choosing to fight us in our strongest lane when we are ahead and we simply can't lose. Warwick has the choice to go bot lane and opt for a fight where he's far more likely to win, but instead comes top lane when we're power spiking and ahead and takes a fight he simply cannot win. Now it's just 10 minutes in. We've taken full tower solo with all five plates and have four kills. The gold lead is 5.2k to 2k. All Warwick had to do was not come top lane and die, but he repeatedly has done it. Now going into mid game, this is going to be super important for us because now we are strong enough to benefit from what is going to happen in the mid game. Now, obviously the decision making from our opponents this game was a little bit flawed to say the least, but there were a few aspects of the decision making that is consistent among lower low players. Now Darius chose to fight us early in this game, despite the fact that Renekton was power spiking with a strong E stone and had the ignite advantage. And then later when Renekton had the level lead, he did the same thing. Now these are all small, often overlooked advantages that low elo players will not even consider. 
Because of this, they will consistently opt into taking fights where they have a less than 50% chance to win. This is best demonstrated though by the enemy Warwick this game. After Warwick hit level 6, he had a really simple choice to make. Does he try to play through his bot and mid lane, who are already massively ahead, where he can choose to take a fight that is almost guaranteed to win? Or does he go top lane and opt into a fight where he has almost no chance to win? Well, we saw what the answer was to that. Players in lower ranks often opt into losing fights, which is why I suggest to play strong skirmishes so you can capitalize on the enemy's early game mistakes to fight you when you're at your strongest. Warwick should never have gained top lane this game though. Not just because Renekton is strong early, but because with the game state he was in, it is just simply not a winnable fight for him. Now this is the exact same mistake that happens pretty consistently at later stages in the game with team fights, especially around neutral objectives and taking towers. In solo queue, people opt into taking a lot of team fights around neutral objectives especially that they simply cannot win. And if you play the correct way around this, you're basically going to be farming your opponent for free kills. So I have in front of me a replay of just this happening. So let's pause for a second and take in all the information. So the objective we're trying to contest and is alive right now is the Rift Herald. But let's take it all in. So on blue team, Katarina and Warwick have a lot of gold. Warwick has 2k, Katarina has 1k. We have a little bit too much gold to fight right now. This is our entire gold lead. Also, our Alistar is in base. Our Caitlyn is bot lane. Our Darius is basing. So here's my question. Should we face check an objective that the enemy is already at while holding 3,000 gold in a 2v5? Yep, apparently we should. So obviously, again, this is not a good play at all. And they are just choosing to die opting into losing fights just because simply there is a neutral objective up and we want to take it. But they don't consider the fact that if you can't fight the neutral objective, you are opting into a losing fight and just donating kills. Now up until this point, I've been pretty harsh with my analysis on the blue team, but that's for a good reason. I'm trying to demonstrate the absurdity of the choices they make and the fights they choose to take, because you need to understand that in solo queue, your opponents and your teammates alike are going to make these decisions all the time. So you need to adjust your gameplay. And if you're strong enough, you can benefit immensely from this in the mid game. So here we are, we've just finished laning phase. We've just taken out our opponent's tower and Renekton is strong. And I mean, really strong. We're gonna change the way that we think and we're gonna play as much as we can to be grouped because we know that fights happen frequently and they happen even when they shouldn't. So you can't always expect it. Now, Renekton is far stronger than Darius this game. If both of these champions turn up to a team fight, Renekton is going to do way more than his lane opponent. So we have to rethink the way that we think about our macro now. If Renekton goes to a fight, he will carry that fight. So it's Darius's job to stop him. Darius should stay in a side lane. He should push as often as possible and force Renekton to go out of the group and give his team a chance to 4v4. But this is the benefit of Renekton having taken his tower. Now that Renekton has killed this wave, he doesn't have to come back top lane until Darius is hitting his tower, and Darius' next wave hasn't even spawned yet. Renekton now gets an almost one minute long roam timer, but realistically, if Darius wants to group with him, that's great. We can stay grouped with our team, we can be in every single fight, and we never have to go side again, and if he just wants to group with us, great. So our Renekton player goes mid and takes out a mid tower. Nice, that's really good. But then you see a little bit of a mistake from the enemy top laner. He's not pushing. We don't have an obligation to go back side. Now, what would strictly be good macro would be to go back side now, push out the wave, force our opponent to respond. But we don't have to. With how strong we are, having 6,000 gold worth of damage, an ult, having enemies who will likely fight into us and not being forced to go back to that side lane, we can just keep roaming. We can take the mid tower, we can bring that into dragon with our team, make sure that no one on our team can fight without us. Now, okay, this didn't go too well because our jungler's not with us, but that's fine. But still, Darius is making that mistake of not forcing us to go side. So we can play the game as a pseudo mid laner. That way we have more influence on the map and we can try and get this mid tower. Now the enemy does come and finally kill us here, but this sequence has been amazing. We got two mid towers, almost got a dragon. And even while we're dying there, we take a bunch of pressure off our teammates who are able to get eh, something on the next sequence. Now, the moment we leave our teammates alone, they die. Again, one of those terrible decisions to opt into a losing fight, this time on our own team, but it presents with us a great opportunity for our next sequence. Now that our teammates are dead, they can't die again. 
So we actually have time to push out that top wave and buy us again, a longer roam timer. Now we've pushed this wave. We don't have to come back top lane for a really long time. The moment we walk over to the group, the enemy has just walked into us with a terrible fight and we just get free kills. And with no real obligation to go back top, we quickly take a wave and we go back to the group and well, there it is again, it's happening. They've just walked out of base and died on us. Okay, cool, we'll respawn. Let's see, do we have to go back top lane? No. And especially on this sequence with teammates already on the map, there's no point risking it. We go straight mid, we stay grouped and we only go back top lane when we have to. But again, the moment we walk out of base, someone is trying to fight us in a fight they just simply can't win. Now, finally, we actually have to go back top lane. But I actually told the student to stay mid this game. We can just give that top tower because, I mean, things are going so well when we're grouped. And the one time we left our team alone, they all died. So rather than defending that one tower, we'll just keep pressing our lead and our opponent will just keep fighting into us. And we're going to get a ton of towers, a ton of gold, a ton of kills. And we can let someone else enter that top wave now. Yeah, we're going to see just again. Dragon has spawned. The enemy team is coming out of base. They have no vision. Do they face check the dragon when Renekton's here and is the strongest member on the team? Yep, they do. And we're here to capitalize yet again. We're playing this game very differently. We're not playing perfect macro. We're not pushing side. We're not farming as many minions as we should. But with how fed we are, how fast the game is played, and how often our opponent opts into losing fights, we can benefit far more from kills and have far more impact in our game than we can by taking minion waves. The more ahead you are in the mid game, the more you can benefit from being grouped and snowballing hard by getting gold in these unpredictable team fights, which is another part of why I recommend that you play something with early game power. This way you can get ahead early and be strong enough to benefit from these fights later and get yourself some kills. Now for you to better understand the macro for being grouped and when to do so, I want to recommend that you watch my video on tempo lines. It's a great way to understand when you have free time to push side waves or do camps, and when you need to drop everything and group, because the risk of a fight taking place is higher. You can see Renekton use his knowledge of tempo lines and grouping went ahead perfectly in this final sequence. Coming out of base, Renekton is heading to catch this giant wave that's crashing into his top tower. If he doesn't catch it, he's losing out on hundreds of gold worth of minions, and at a high elo, he would always go there. But because of where his teammates are, and how their tempo lines are compared to his, he needs to make some sacrifice to his farm in order to match his team. Because of this, he's here at the moment when something unexpected happens and a fight breaks out in mid, against an opponent who is obviously opting into a fight they simply can't win. 